We have with us Donna Minkowitz, who was a columnist on queer culture and politics for the Village Voice for eight years in the 80s and 90s, which is an extraordinary time for the growth of the power of the gay and lesbian movement. She won a Glad Media Award for her reporting at The Voice, and later won a special journalism honor from Radcliffe for a piece in which she disguised herself as a 16-year-old evangelical Christian boy to write about the Christian men's right, Christian right men's movement for Ms. Magazine. Her first memoir, Ferocious Romance, won a Lambda Literary Award, and tonight she's here to share her second memoir, Growing Up Golem, which Hugo and Nebula award-winning author Terry Beeson called Rich and Wild, Dark and Funny, as fearless as her legendary journalism and as scary as a fairy tale. So down. Thank you so much. And I'm so happy you all came out tonight. And um, I'm very grateful to the Leslie Lohman Museum for hosting this. Um, it's an amazing museum, which I only became aware of um, last spring. And it has extraordinary art, and the exhibitions change frequently, and it's free. So I would encourage people to really frequent it and, um, and find out what the next exhibitions are. So I'm going to read from Growing Up Golem, which I'm describing as a magical realist memoir. What you need to know before I read this passage is, in the book, I'm Donna Minkowitz, myself, who goes and writes for the Village Voice. But I'm also a golem, which is sort of a clay robot from Jewish mythology. Um, golems are created as slaves by very powerful uh, rabbis or magicians using Jewish magic. They mold a creature out of clay and magically invest it with life using one of the names of God. In the book, my mother is one of these powerful Jewish magicians. And in real life, she actually did tell my sisters and me that she could do magic from the Kabbalah. <coughs> the other thing you need to know is that golems are essentially fake. They're fake human beings, basically. Um, finally, at the time of this story, all sorts of peculiar changes have been happening in my life. My mother has been telling us she's dying for 30 years, but suddenly it seems she really is dying. Um, also, I've gotten a weird arm injury that won't go away. I'll start here. I had just broken up my two very closest friendships, one of which I had considered a marriage to a gay man by whom I not only didn't get stooped, but often didn't get my phone calls returned. Perhaps this was a series of crumbly anticlimaxes because just before that, Edna, my therapist of 12 years, had suddenly dumped me. She said she just realized that our therapy wasn't working. My first book had come out to poor sales, although my publisher had claimed the book would make me the next Susan Faludi right before Edna dumped me. Before that, I'd left the village voice, my soul and tightly gripped foothold in the writing world, because they had promised to make me an official salaried staff writer and had gone back on it. Me, I had slipped into the voice at the age of 22 and snuck, wormed, even stolen my way into writing for them. Why else would the paper I believed in more than any other publication in the country publish me? I wasn't a real person and I knew it. I have always been a makeshift artificial person, like a scary doll or a ventriloquist dummy. And I have always known that I would be found out eventually and punished for my evil dissimulation. I have always hated being as porous as I am, able to be filled with others' content. Mimsy, the word Lewis Carroll coined for flimsy and miserable at once, unlocalizable, able to take any shape, especially when directed by my mother. Fay, impish, effeminate, will o' the wisp. Mercurial, multifarious, counterfeit in my very being like a photocopy of a human. Like those beautiful beings Puck and Ariel, who were really nothing more than great looking impressive slaves when you get right down to it. With them, as with me, there is no there there. All the creatures of fairy are tricksy, thievish, prestidigitational performers. Fairies have the duplicity of all subject peoples. 
I have always felt my own two-ness, always known that I was only half a person, if that much. I realized very young that I was the true referent all those men unthinkingly have in mind when they refer to some gay man as a lightweight or a twinkle toes, someone who cannot fill his own deep human shoes. I am the one they really meant. I have never been a real person, and I have always dissembled, or as my fairy kin like to say, beguiled. And I cannot help it, reader. Camus may have said liberty is the right not to lie, but as for me, I have never been free. And I hate it. I hate lying, which is the same as having no history, no will, and no capacity for connection with anyone. Liars do not speak the same language as friends, and therefore they cannot be friends. All my life I've been able to vanish quickly as a mouse, to borrow and not repay, to lie as lightly as a leprechaun. My mother taught me how to do all three. They form, in fact, almost the sum of the moral philosophy she taught me. My mother was, not to put too fine a point on it, a professor of philosophy, and one of her most influential papers was a lesson plan for children about the goodness of lying and the utter foolishness of every moral system that condemned it out of hand. For years, this curriculum was actually taught to public school children in Montclair, New Jersey, as a result of my mother's efforts. The proof of the lying lesson went like this. You see your friend Stacy running fast in one direction. When she is out of sight, a group of tough guys runs up to you looking angry. Some of them are holding sticks and pipes. Their leader says, where's that Stacy? We're so mad at her. We're going to get her. You point in the opposite direction from the way she ran. Did you do the right thing? My mother extended this example to all other possible cases of lying. I had to lie to my aunt, to my grandparents, about things we had spent too much money on or too little, where we had gone on vacation, the fact that I ate the free lunches offered by the city in my public school, the fact that my mother had told me at age nine, at age nine what my aunt's first experiences, first 10 experiences of intercourse with her husband had been like. Excruciatingly painful, but she persevered, and the 11th was pleasurable. I had been at the wedding of Aunt Natalie and her husband, Bernie, and it was both fun and discomforting to know what their first intercourse experiences had been like. And I had to lie to my sisters. Don't tell Josie I said this, Mommy said, but I happen to know that she is very, very jealous of you. I never told Josie my mother had warned me about this, but it influenced how I acted with Josie to the end of my days. To my other sister, Afra, I could not reveal that my mother had said Afra was a schizophrenic and pathologically unable to separate from her. My mother brought me with her to the New York Human Resources Administration, the city's welfare office, so that she would erroneously seem to be a poor single mother. You always get more sympathy when you have a child with you, Mommy giggled. <laughs> I was eight. We were lying and saying that Daddy didn't live with us and didn't share his income as a salesman with us. No one can live on welfare and no other income, she told me. It's too low. You have to lie. In a sense, she was certainly right. It was true you couldn't live even the slightest bit well on welfare, including every family member buying books if they desired them, having the children go to camp, even at scholarship rates in the summers, having meat, considered an important food for children in the 60s and 70s, available several, time, several times a week. If you'll bear with me one sec. There we go. OK. <clears throat> we shopped only at the really cheap clothing stores, Alexander's, Klein's, that Pennyworth Apparel Wonderland maze. Anybody remember maze? But strangely, we sometimes went to Cape Cod for a two-week vacation. My mom said we were poor. She made sure we had piano, singing, ballet, and art lessons, either according to age. All six-year-olds had to begin studying piano, for example, in our family, talent or inclination. My father worked alternately some lower middle class, working class, and a few lumpen jobs. Salesman for gates on stores, and by phone for cemetery plots, delivery man for wise potato chips, and later crullers at 5 AM to greasy spoons, once hand her out of flyers for a midtown sex parlor. Beautiful Asian masseuses, they said. 
My father, a silent man, didn't tell about the flyers. It was my mother who blabbed about them gleefully. The difference between her job as a philosophy professor and hers as, and his as a donut deliverer and pimp's helper was the essence of my mother's mercurialness, her extreme mobility, and she thought her brilliance, her ability to turn dross into something shiny. She told my sisters and me that we were brilliant too, everyone but my father, who she said was stupid and ugly and smelly, so that our splendid educations, including my mother's, came to seem the gold she had produced from the lead and dirty coal of my father's work by means of her own personal and unprecedented powers of alchemy. My mother's work didn't produce very much income. Um, as a professor, like many in our big name city, New York, where instructors are supposed to live on prestige alone, she never made it above adjunct stage, but it produced so much glory that for my sisters and me, it was like looking at the sun. The problem for us was that my father really did smell bad, not like a man who has gone to work and not yet showered, but like a homeless person or a half-breed monster created by an evil magician and kept locked in the basement. Its smell of rotting garbage occasionally rising above the extraordinary magic sprays of air freshener and drowning them out. I felt sorry for my little father monster. I still do for the smell he bore for his and my mother's experiments. Was he her familiar, her assistant, her subject? And that he still exudes from his plot in New Jersey, 30 years on the ground. We had to put special chemicals in. My father had needed potentially toxic doses of preservatives and industrial wastes to keep him from, from simply decaying even in life after the worst experiment had ended the one where his tissues were interchanged with those of a female bear, and he was baited for four years in a time travel medieval English zoo, so that the already poisoned soil of New Jersey was deemed to be the only sustainable site for him when his time came. My mother said none of me came from him, but I wonder. Certainly I was more plastic than him, but did that make me more or less free? How can we say? I believe I had to lie more. Now, I'm going to skip ahead a little and go to um, my reporting days at The Voice. I have always understood that I had to use special means to get ahead as a non-human with a divided self. Half of myself was mom's and half my own. I had special deficits, I knew, the very opposite of, of superpowers. Don't ever put me near a flame because I'd go up like a straw doll soaked in kerosene. Don't tap me even lightly on a special panel in the middle of my back because that would turn me off until you wished to turn me on again. I had to lie as hard as I could so that no one ever found out. So when I first came down to the Village Voice at 22, I took over one of the two free computers intended for all freelancers, seized it as my own. I'll say for um, the younger folks that lots of people didn't have computers at home in those days. And anyway, the voice had a big mainframe that you had to be connected to if you wanted to file stories there. Um, so I, I took over one of these two free computers that are supposed to be free for everyone. I put my files and my coffee cup there, my own gorilla seizure, just like Fidel or Che. Everything I did felt like a revolutionary appropriation to me then, or some sort of theft. I was the best freeloader in Brooklyn. I would sponge $20 from a friend with no intention of paying it back. $20 in 80s dollars, that is. Or bagels and hummus and salad from the buffet of a conference I was not attending. <laughs> I used my sister Josie's credit card with her permission, but no intention of paying her back on time. Since she made more money than me, I thought it was fine to make her lay it out until I paid her. If you want to know my mindset, Think of my kinsman, the gingerbread man, running and successfully getting away from all those sets of lips and teeth. When another freelancer objected to my taking over the computer, only one ever did, though sad to say it was the one who later won the Pulitzer, I played dumb. Yeah, that's my stuff, I said politely, smiling. Oh, is it not supposed to be there? I'm sorry, but I'd kept it there. I needed my own recognized place of the voice, and I also needed what that place would signify, 
that I was a real and legitimate writer for the paper, one who was entitled to a private desk and phone line. I pretended that I had these already. I expropriated them, or to use my favorite phrase, I liberated them. There was a phone line at the free computer. I told the voice operator to put my calls through to me at that extension, and it became my phone line. Folks like me have always had to be good at acting. All the golems in Jewish history had been ordered to dress up as, go as goyim in order to investigate who was behind the blood libels. Of course, the golems had had to pretend to be human beings in the first place, even before they put on their special goyim suits. Previously, I had pretended things because my mother forced me to, but now I was acting for my own purposes. I knew nothing about reporting, not even that one ought to tell the truth. My mother had taught me that truth is a matter of fighting for one's interests, not revealing secrets for nothing. The gingerbread man became my model. He looked like a person, and so effectively became a person, until someone finally caught and ate him. My plan was to write for the voice as much as possible until that happened. Soon, as they say in Bountiful 12-step, I acted as if I should be given a column. The voice ridiculously obliged. The column was called Body Politics. Oh, if you insist on holding me to petty accuracies, I must reveal that I shared the column alternate weeks with a cantankerous and talented sea monster named Richard Goldstein. Richard, 70 feet long and colored orange with big, unpleasant, gray constricting coils down the length of his body was my editor. Everyone else was afraid to work with him. Everything gay in content had to get past Richard before it could be allowed into the paper, and he was a terrifying guardian. He was also a brilliant writer in his own right, but he didn't start writing about gay love till I was in college when I read him for the first time and wanted to lick his throat and hands for hours. I didn't know he was a sea monster and didn't have a throat or hands. His writing was so good that I would have sucked his monstrous coils. Richard was rather like my mother, but with a penis, and with less narcissism about his personal appearance. He was the most dominant person I have ever met, but then at 22, I was most accustomed to interacting with dominant and terrifying persons, and it was probably more comfortable for me to go into Richard's office and have him wrap his tentacles around me and squeeze than it would have been to have a gentle, kindly editor. I wooed him. This was the word I always used for what I did with Richard. I was a persistent suitor once I'd found out he was the Cerberus of Gaydom. And I wooed him with the fierce young demonstrators in my articles, hot girls and boys from the free queer states, radical commentary and doggy treats, until he sighed contented like a mesmerized, hog, mesmerized hogfish and rolled over. Would someone mind getting me a little more seltzer or water? Oh, bless you, Jonathan. Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> My power to sing Richard's asleep was only partial, of course. Sometimes he would lick story ideas from my hands slowly and rhythmically for hours, only to stir of a sudden and leap ferociously from my throat. The copy editors and fact checkers hated him because they were the least powerful people at the paper, and he was rude to them, kept them waiting for hours, thank you so much, and often prevented them from doing their jobs on pieces he had written or edited overruling them in the exercise of the only authority they had. The copy editors and fact checkers were mostly my age. I had been a freelance copy editor in their ranks during the whole time I wooed Richard. And they were also writers, but unlike me had won over no monster editor to their side. I would smile inside whenever Richard was rude to them, feeling the cosmic joy of being preferred by a parental sea monster who was nasty and hurtful to all the other children. I flattered myself that he was never nasty and hurtful to me. In fact, he was many times, but I trained myself assiduously not to notice. Now, for this last section, <clears throat> I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Um, uh, I'm in... Um, I'm in junior high, and I start reading the voice. Uh, my mother brings it home, and my sister. The voice actually cost money in those days, but we willingly paid for it. 
It was the best periodical around, except for maybe, maybe the New Yorker, which was outside our acquaintance, probably because of class. I started out reading mostly the personal ads. Sometimes my sisters and my mom and I would read them aloud together, laughing. Afra, 17, liked reading Jill Johnston and would keep Jill's lesbo treatises on the kitchen table and say how much she loved them. By 14, I myself was much more in love with Jeff Weinstein and Ellen Willis. Ellen Willis wrote about her desires, even if they were ugly or unfeminine or antisocial or disturbingly self-undermining. She was fearless in a way that neither male writers nor feminists had been to that point. She ruthlessly exposed her own contradictions. Willis wrote that she could not simply dismiss the sex pistols sexist and nasty anti-abortion song, Bodies, although it was, she said, an outburst of loathing for human physicality, a loathing projected onto women because they have babies and abortions and are, quote, a fucking bloody mess, as the Sex Pistols put it. She could not just dismiss the song, she wrote, because the extremity of its disgust forced me to admit that I was no stranger to such feelings. I couldn't admit that, I, sorry, I couldn't believe anyone would admit they had disturbing and terrifying feelings that undermined their own deepest strength. I only had feelings of that kind, and I did not plan on broadcasting it. None of my feelings were connected to my source of strength because golems are bred for self-disgust and a permanent discipline. Still, the Voices restaurant reviewer, Jeff Weinstein, did not seem to be disgusted by anyone or anything. He could even love food products that had actually been manufactured in factories. On one occasion, Jeff wrote a sensual and moving review of a canned spray that smelled exactly like the scent of a warm, buttery apple pie. He quoted Keats in order to praise that apple pie spray. That review spoke to me. Did not sprays have their poetry too, and the tormented aluminum beings their own beating hearts? I lived in the world of poetry despite having some industrial garbage in me and even some chemical food preservatives that drying had helped to form my faux skeleton. Why couldn't a spray can hang out at Max's Kansas City and drink beers and write its own occasional poetry too? Some people had mind-blowing sex with their TVs, so why should it be inconceivable that a being like me, a sort of extra thoughtful, extra passionate toaster, was capable of love? Fuck. There is, oh reader, inevitably something more that I'm not saying. A thing I have to mention before I tell you what happened to my arms and with the married woman, okay, I haven't mentioned her to you guys, but anyway, she's in there, and the rest of this terrible story. It sticks in my throat. Or it inheres in the skin under my skin. I have always been quite confused about what kinds of things are my body and what kinds of things aren't it. What my mother attached to me with the extra glue left over at the end. How far my body extends into the world and which objects are actually embedded in it and which are other than me. So, in the organs beneath my first layer of cleverly shaped imitation human organs, in the old sheep call membrane she stitched inside as an extra structure on which to hang all that painted work, the taxidermy and paper mache that form my base, with nickels and lifesavers and Christmas ornaments embedded here and there to spark the magic, there is an activity that does not like to describe itself, but I will tell you what it is. My mother put locks on her speech, on my speech, even the speech of some little gnomes and watchful ghosts we had around the house, but I have found a way to pick them all. I've already told you I'm a good liar. I'm pretty swell at cheating at cards, lock picking, and escaping, too. I am covered with oil. You cannot keep me tied. I am Houdini. I am Proteus. My mother, I feel stupid now for all the suspense. You probably won't even find this a big deal. Why am I breaking out the good olive oil for this? You'll probably just think that I'm a huge baby. Well, she used to do things that turned me on sexually. It confused me and ignited me. 
Both those things happened when my mother danced out in front of me with no clothes on, or in her most ecstatic panties, silk nothings tied with bows, or else exquisitely see-through, red or black, filmy and beautiful, asking, don't I look sexy? She would model nightly for me and my sisters. There was a bra of fire-colored lace in which the cleav through which the cleavage was a heaven that I tried not to look at. There was a gorgeous blouse and pants set with an Edenic apple tree stretching wide across her breasts, a set my mother was wearing when she told us delightedly a man had mistaken her as a, for a prostitute and asked how much she cost. The prostitute mistaking had happened that very afternoon. The new clothes and the modeling began right after my mother's surgery when the new hole had been carved into the bottom of her neck. My mom had a permanent trach. Um, she survived an operation for cancer of the larynx, but so she had this trach for um, the last 25 or 30 years of her life. Um, her nose and mouth had been disconnected from her breathing apparatus. Perhaps this was the reason why she seemed to have become an entirely different person. For a few months after the operation, my mother was only able to eat disgusting looking, foul scented foods she prepared for herself in a blender spinach or chicken or liver puree, along with actual jars of baby food. I was much younger then, only seven, and my mother had suddenly changed her wardrobe and all her customs around dressing and undressing. She, sh she showed herself naked to us kids for the first time, and her newly seen body seemed white hot. No one in my family had gone naked to the others before then, except pre presumably my mother and father to each other. Now my mother showed her nipples to me, smiling as I watched. They were large and brown, luscious and disturbing to me. She wore a tiny yellow sundress that made her look exactly like the hillbilly dreamboat Daisy May in the Little Abner Sunday comic that I read each week with lust and confusion. Daisy May looked skanky but lovely, and her so deep cleavage gave her a confusing, shameful power over all the men. I began to have a new job every afternoon, washing my mother's back in the, in the bathtub. I never questioned why it was my job and not, say, my father's, but I came to sit on the tub whenever my mother summoned me, dreading it. I was supposed to wash her back to prevent her from drowning, my mother said. She was afraid of accidentally getting water into her new hole if she washed herself. My mother would conversationally refer to the trach as my hole. Why she thought a seven-year-old would be better at not getting water there, I do not know. My mother washed all of her other parts herself, including her lustrous long black hair, but her back with creamy freckles all over it, a beautiful back, as my mother always told us, was for me to wash with a washcloth. I cannot remember any more paralyzing moment from my childhood than entering that bathroom and trying to avoid looking at my mother's breasts or her vagina from under the waters, its hair gone smooth and luxuriant. I would cross that enormous expanse from the bathroom door through the entire front side of my mother and finally get to the back, which was less frightening, but still too creamy and beautiful. I tried not to look at any other part of my mother but her back. I told my mother I didn't like washing her back, but she said I had to or she would drown. I finally stopped doing it, perhaps by 14. As a result, reader, I was not used to getting what I wanted. I was used to longing for what I needed and never ever getting it, to staring at what I needed shamefaced from the other side of the bathroom in fear and regret and love and pain. All golems have faced immediate death at every moment because their makers could kill them by writing just one letter of the alphabet on their bodies or erasing one by telling them to die, a command that every golem must obey, by pulling a holy scrap of paper out of their mouths on which a secret name of God had been written, or by walking around the golem three times and saying God's names backwards. So I was terrified each time I came close to anything I needed that it was going to be snatched from me, like my mother snatching the life-conferring paper out of my mouth, my ticket being snatched, dying again, the way I did every afternoon washing my mother's back, given a hope of living, and then frustrated. 
and I'll stop there and take questions. Thank you.